We have done research on the growth of countries, of nations, and growth rates of nations are very closely linked to the skills of their population. And the skills of their population actually can be measured reliably with performance on these math and science tests that have been given to students around the world. Development is about a lot of different things coming together. So where do basic skills fit into that equation? So we're talking about the single driver, for the most part, of long-run development. And today, we hear from an economist who's got the numbers to prove it. I'm Eric Hanushek. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. I'm an economist who has studied education policy for a long period of time and have tried to understand why some nations achieve more than others and what the impact of that is. Well, welcome to the podcast once again. It's nice to be back, Bruce. So most people listening to this podcast will have had the privilege of, of acquiring the, the skills that we need to function at least to some degree in, in society. But I think most will also be as surprised as I was to hear just how many people out there don't have those basic skills. Can you paint us a bit of a picture of the skills deficit out there in the world based on what you found while doing this research? My colleague Ludger Woosman and I tried to understand which nations are prepared to grow into the future and to enter the modern economy. And we used a fairly simple definition of the skills that are required. We said that people had to have the sort of lowest level of performance on the PISA test, the international test from the OECD. And it's easy to describe what the lowest level is. Ask a 15-year-old if they can reliably solve the following problem. I flew from the U.S. to Europe last week, and I paid $2,500 for my ticket. The exchange rate between the dollar and the British pound is 1 to 1.25. What did my ticket cost in British pounds? So it's not really a stretch problem, you think, for a 15-year-old. But we tried to f look around the world and find out how many 15-year-olds could reliably solve that problem. Now, with, with some manipulation that we can talk about later, we got a world picture of how many 15-year-olds and, by implication, what proportion of the populations, because the 15-year-olds probably know more than the adults in many of these countries. Yeah. Um, and we find that at least two-thirds of the people of the world cannot reliably solve that exchange rate problem. That, that's incredible. Um, it might even be larger. We, we have some uncertainty about two large countries, China and India, about how many people in those countries can, in fact, solve that problem. But giving the sort of benefit of the doubt to more people being able to solve it in China than not, it's two-thirds of the world's population. Now, I take it you're as surprised as we were to find that it's so large, but it fits in with the fact that a quarter of the people in the developed countries of the world cannot solve that problem either. Yeah, that also surprised me. One quarter of kids in high-income in high income countries uh, have that same problem. That's absolutely the case. And it's our assertion, assumption, that in fact, you have to be able to have a skill level sort of at that level in order to participate in a modern productive economy. And so what we're saying out of this is that the challenges of economic development are perhaps larger than many of us had thought before. So uh, you were driven uh, and have been driven for many years, as you said in your introduction, to understand the skills gap, n not as an educator, uh, but as an economist looking for 
the drivers of development. How does this basic skills gap play into growth and development in the world? Well, what we find in our research is that three quarters of the variation in growth rates around the world can be explained by simple measures of test performance of the, of the population. So that we're talking about the single driver for the most part of long run development. Now I should say this is long run growth and most of the media focuses on what's going to happen next year. Mm -hmm. In fact, the IMF regularly tells us what's going to happen to uh, countries developed and developing next year. But what we're talking about is the long run, which really makes a difference for the well-being of societies in the future. Hmm. So, so let's talk about the economics of, of all this. You've crunched the numbers while doing this research. What are the potential economic gains uh, from raising basic skill levels across the world? Um, you're sitting down, I take it, Bruce. Uh, hmm. the, the answer is that if all of the countries of the world raise their skill level to these basic skill levels, the historical evidence suggests that the world GDP would be $700 trillion larger wow. than it is today, or five times the world GDP today uh, in present value terms. So what we're doing is adding up the effects of growth across the remaining century, but we're doing it in present value terms, so it's in current dollars. Wow, that's incredible. And I assume that... Uh some regions would benefit from it more than other regions. But overall, uh, I mean, the $700 trillion is a huge number. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, if we just look at uh, North America itself, our estimates are that North America would gain some $40 trillion. Um, so that we're talking in the developed parts of the world and obviously... South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are the ones that are farthest behind, and they're the ones that would gain tremendously because they have large populations and large populations of unskilled workers. So if they're going to participate in the future, if we're going to meet the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, we have to change the skill levels in these countries. Exactly. So you're trying to tie this research into the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as you just said, uh, which actually includes one specifically for education. But what you're saying here is that it's more than just education, that, that increasing basic skills should be actually the starting point for development across the board. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if this is heresy or not when we talk about the Sustainable Development Goals, but the United Nations in 2015 passed the 17 different goals that were very ambitious goals like eliminating poverty around the world, ensuring that there's clean water, ensuring that development is such that it sustains the world environment into the future. But our view is that the only way you can approach the development goals is by improving the economies of the countries around the world. You have to have more resources. You can't just redistribute your way to eliminating poverty around the world. And so um, what we're really saying is that economic growth has to be the primary driver of the other sustainable development goals. And then we're saying that education and skill levels drive economic growth. So that fundamentally, if we want to take the development goals seriously, we have to pay more attention to the quality of our schools and the skills that people are getting before they get into the labor market. Okay, so with all the money spent on development every year, uh, and you cite in, in this piece in Finance and Development that in 2020 there was $161 billion, you know, distributed as you know, aid money or uh, money that mm -hmm. is supposed to go towards development. Um, so uh, given the, the potential returns, these returns that you're talking about, why isn't it happening already? I mean, why are we spending 
all this money on development and not doing what we need to be doing in terms of raising, increasing basic skill levels? Well, I'm not sure about that. It's a little bit frustrating that uh, education always gets pushed off. And it's partly that, well, education's good, but we can get to that tomorrow. Let's build a bridge first, or Mm -hmm. let's take care of, of the water supply first. And these are important things. But what we're saying is that all of those infrastructure grants and so forth aren't going to add up to long-run development unless the skills of the population also improve. So as I understand it, and you also mentioned this a little earlier on, it's the OECD's program for uh, International Student Assessment, or PISA, that provides most of the data. I assume this is where you gathered your data on achievement levels. Uh, Do all countries, or actually you mentioned that India and China don't participate in this program, so how do you actually measure when those two most populous countries in the world don't participate? Well, that's been the subject of some considerable research that Ludger Wusner and I have been doing. It turns out that almost 100 countries of the world have at one time or another participated in the PISA test, but that leaves another uh, 60 to 100 countries that uh, we have to try to estimate what their skill levels are without having direct estimates. What what we've been able to do is to, for a large number of them, merge in regional tests. For example, there's a regional test of reading and math for kids in sub-Saharan Africa, and there's a similar regional test in Latin America. What we've been trying to do, and I think we're, we've been pretty successful at it, is to equate scores on these regional tests to th- those on the PISA tests, so we put everybody on a mm. common scale. Right. There's still some holes of countries that don't participate in regional tests or the international test. China has had a few of its very industrialized East Coast provinces participate, Shanghai and Beijing and a couple others, but they haven't bothered or haven't wanted to test the rest of the country. And we know that the rural west of China is very different than the urban east of China. So we have tried to use various methods there, but one one method is just to assume that nobody in the rural areas gets these basic skills, that the schools are not up to it. So that gives a, an outer bound on that. And if you take that outer bound, you end up saying that, well, maybe three quarters of the population of the world doesn't reach basic skills instead of the two thirds. Uh, so, so this uh, education deficit was a problem before the pandemic. And, and I assume it's more of a problem now with all the school closures that happened over the course of those two years or or more. To what degree has has the pandemic set us back in terms of getting to where we need to be? Well, the pandemic has obviously been a serious blow to the schooling of youth uh, today. Um, And there are two aspects to this. One is that almost every country of the world has suffered some learning losses from this. By by learning losses, I mean that the kids who were in school in March of 2020, when everybody closed down for the pandemic, kids in school then um, are not learning as much or haven't learned as much as those who were two years older, who had been in schools before the pandemic. And if we look at that, we see that there are huge losses for developed as well as developing countries. In developed countries, if I look at the U.S., for example, my current estimate based upon some data we have of the amount of learning losses is that the average kid who was shut out of schools in March of 2020 and went through some sort of erratic development of schools after that is kids went back to school and so forth, Mm -hmm. those people are going to suffer a 6 to 9% loss of lifetime earnings. Wow. Um, 
but that's for developed countries. And what we know is two things. One is that it's been much worse for disadvantaged kids in the developed countries. So poor kids and minority kids in the U.S. are going to suffer larger losses unless we do something about it. But developing countries are even worse off. So Uganda set uh, the world record, I think, by having their schools physically closed for two years. And they have no real options of internet instruction. Internet instruction in general is not as good as in-person instruction, but they don't have that option. And so if you look at some of the poorest countries of the world, they've really been struck by this pandemic in ways that will become apparent over the next century, but they've been set back dramatically. How unfortunate. So, so it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot of catching up to do and, and perhaps uh, you know, somebody will come up with ways of, of trying to get that done, but I assume in developing countries that's going to be extra challenging. So it's not only about getting people into school, but it's also about investing in the, in the quality of the education because uh, your research also shows that just because these kids are in school it doesn't mean that they're actually learning the, the skills that they need to be learning. So how do we get to a point where school systems are, in fact, efficient and teachers can raise those basic skill levels in every region of the world to, to where they need to be? Well, this is the challenge, of course. Um, And you're correct to bring up the fact that originally we thought, well, the problem of developing countries is that kids aren't in school, that there's a lot of kids that don't actually attend school. And if we just get them into school where everything will be fine. It turns out that if you look around the world, I said two thirds of the population can't solve that exchange rate problem meeting basic skills, but just about 60% of the kids who are actually in school around the world cannot solve that problem. So we have a lot of schools that are not preparing their children in the future society for a modern economy. The challenge, of course, is that everybody, if you ask them, says they want to improve their schools. And we have consistent views that we want to improve the schools, but we haven't done much and we haven't made much progress in most countries. In some countries, we've seen actual progress. If you look at uh, Peru or Chile, you see that over the last decade or decade and a half, those countries have in fact found ways to improve their schools. But it's a hard, hard task. Because even there, in the countries that have shown improvement, it's a fragile improvement. And as best I can tell now, with changes of political leadership in both Peru and Chile, their schools are under pressure and may not, in fact, continue to be a growing, developing part of their economy. So it, it's partly, the first thing you have to say is that it's political will to, in fact, invest in the future of society. After that, it gets tricky because we don't have any single answers of ways that we can magically transform the schools. We know that there are certain institutional features that are really, really important, like measuring performance. You know, as we said, a, a substantial number of countries around the world have never participated in any systematic testing. So they're just really flying blind. So these countries have to measure what they're doing um, and then use that information to try to refine their system. How do you get more effective teachers? How do you set up accountability systems that provide incentives for better performance? These are all things that have to be worked on. And there's no single answer. We can't say, this is the way they do it in Florida, so you people in Uganda should use the Florida model. That, that really doesn't work very well. And so it's got to be local solutions, but that there's a common structure to them.
Eric Hanushek, thanks so much for sharing this research, <laughs> very important research, I gotta say. Uh, senior fellow at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University. Thanks again. Thanks, Bruce. Eric Hanushek is also the co-author, along with Ludger Wusman, of an article titled The Basic Skills Gap, published in the June issue of Finance and Development magazine. Check it out at imf.org slash fnd. And look for other IMF podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at IMF underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Thanks for listening. Thank you.